Hey, remember, we're talking about aspects of the mind and memory, where our bad thoughts and irrational behaviors and not so good emotions come from. I've got something very special to share with you today. That's the model that we use in Supernoetics. And to illustrate this point, I'm going to use a series of uh, diagrams which you can look at instead of looking at me. <laughs> Okay, let's start with this here. This is showing the fact that modern science is completely obsessed with everything about our being and our mind and our nature and our emotions, moods, feelings, all of those things are all totally in the brain. It's a material view, meaning there can't be any such thing as immaterial thought. They don't believe there's such a thing as an immaterial spirit. They're completely stuck in the mind as a machine kind of model. They are saying, in effect, that you, everything about you, your personality, nature, thoughts and feelings, all come from this three pound blob of jelly inside your skull. Unfortunately, there are a number of things wrong with this particular model. Uh, not the least of which is that some people are walking around with hardly any brain and yet nobody notices. I'm talking about a condition called hydrocephalus, which just means water on the brain. What happens is there's a blockage in the drainage systems of the brain and the ventricles in there, which are full of fluid, uh, they swell, they back up, and there's an increased pressure which squeezes the brain against the inside of the skull. And as a result, the brain tissue degenerates. Listen, there are people going around that have as little as one or two percent of their original brain tissue left. You might think that's horrible and that's tragic and of course it's serious. But you know, the most remarkable thing is that the person doesn't know and often friends and relatives, family and loved ones don't know and they don't notice anything. The person's uh, character is largely unchanged, their memories are certainly intact. And this fits with a famous series of experiments that were done on animals in the 1950s by a man called Carl Lashley. He chopped up uh, rats and tried to find out where in their brain memory was. He was, in those days, into the idea of me memory as a trace on cells. He, these were called engrams. It's a word that goes back to uh, early 1900s. But Carl Lashley was determined to find out where memory was, and long story short, he couldn't. He kept chopping out bits of the rat's brains, and still they could remember their way through the maze and so on. So really, the idea that memory and personality is, is brain-based is really a non-starter. Now, part of the evidence that conventional scientists like to use for this idea that we're only brain is the fact that if you fool around with the brain, you can produce changes in thought and feelings and experiences and so on. So they say, well, you see, that proves that the brain is the cause of all these things. It's not even logical. It's true to say that the brain lights up in different areas according to what sort of uh, emotional or cognitive or thinking experience you're having, but that's, that's a million miles from saying it's the cause of it. Look, we all, we all, let me do a little example to illustrate this. We all have cell phones, smartphones, okay? Now, using this little device, you can call anywhere in the world. You could, uh, you know, from here, I'm standing in my office in Las Vegas. I could call New York. I could call Seattle. Listen, I could call Sydney, Australia. I could call London, all of those places. What they're saying is that that proves that the whole world is in my cell phone. You know, if you go in there and mess up a couple of chips, you can't speak to London anymore, or London sounds garbled, and therefore uh, the whole world is in your cell phone. We have proved that. No, they haven't. That's just completely crazy. You'll see what I mean. Uh, same with the sort of radio broadcast. If you fool around with the knobs, you can change the tuning of what you're getting from the radio. That doesn't mean that the broadcasting channel, you know, the radio station, is inside the radio set on your desktop. That's crazy. So, so you know, remember this cell phone model next time somebody wants to tell you. It's all in the brain. It's proven. If you uh, activate certain areas, you get certain feelings. Uh, it's a done deal. It just isn't. It's not even logical, never mind scientific. Okay, so moving on. 
Uh, take a look instead at this model here, which we call the extended mind. Now, before I actually go on to this next, uh, next graphic, let me ask you to just do a simple test. What I want you to do is close your eyes and just visualize something. Let's say a nice uh, elephant. Get a picture of an elephant and then hold your hand or point to, to where this picture is or to where it seems to be. And you'll find that almost everybody puts their hand out here. Okay, this is when you say, where, where is that picture in your mind? Well, it's here, out in front. Uh, now, of course, and by the way, 99% of people say that. I've only had one person in the last 30 years has ever said different, you know, pointed to in the brain. But I'd just like to suggest that's really conditioning. That's what the person th thought they were supposed to say, so they did. Our actual experience is, no, it's out here. Now, science says, oh, that's just ridiculous. It only appears to be out there. But look, I ask them, well, where is the data for the opinion that you've just expressed? It's an opinion that this is only pretending to be out here. Where's the evidence? And of course they scoff and huff and puff. Uh, we don't have to produce evidence for things like that. It's obvious it's in the brain, so it only appears to be out here. But actually, it is out here. <laughs> this is a much bigger concept that we call the extended mind. The mind is much vaster than the brain. Uh, it's a non-material phenomenon anyway, spreads outwards. How big? Well, the answer is probably as big as the cosmos. A, a British writer called G.K. Chesterton famously said that the cosmos is about the tiniest hole in which you can squeeze a human mind. And if you think about that, that's a, a very clever way of putting it. Uh, we are as big as anything that we can embrace in thought and mind, and most of us today can embrace the idea of a cosmos, even if we can't, you know, we don't really know what happens beyond the apparent edges. So this non-material mind phenomenon then, we call the extended mind. Rupert Sheldrake has written about it. He called, calls, uh, calls up the model of a morphic resonance field and that minds can influence other minds. It's almost like there's a, you know, upstairs there's a place where you can upload knowledge and information and other people on planet Earth can, can download that knowledge. Th listen, this would explain things like out-of-body experiences and telepathy and things which conventional science thinks just doesn't happen and they're rubbish. Well, the answer is they don't have the right model. You know, we're not just a three-pound blob of jelly in here. Uh, in our heads we are uh, we're, we're, we're out there, as it were, <laughs> and that has a lot to do with spirit and psyche as well. Okay, so I promised you on this model we could explain a lot more about feelings and thoughts and behavior. Uh, take a look at this graphic here. This is the extended mind outside the, the head, as you can see. Uh, we have a what you might call a clear mind space or the free mind area, but look in there there's a lot of clutter. These black shadows represent unpleasant experiences, uh, charged emotional experiences. I've already introduced you to these. We call them memonemes. And these are sort of negative residues in the mind. Uh, our attention is drawn to a great degree to these uh, experiences from the past, and we have a, a certain number of attention units that get locked up in the past in this way. So you'd expect logically that if we got rid of some of these, then we'd have freed up memory, freed up attention units. We'd probably be a bit more on the ball, more alert and smart uh, in moving forward in the present moment, what we call the now, fashionably called the now these days. Uh, I've always called it present time, but you know, here in present time, the more attention units you've got, the more efficient uh, and the better at solving problems you're, you're going to be. Okay, so I've introduced already in one of the talks the concept of supernoetics piloting, where we're dismantling some of these uh, structures within the mind, getting off these charged memory events, or memonemes as we call them. And you'll see in this, uh, this graphic here the idea that uh, as we do so, as we pop off these black charged areas or negatives, what happens is that the free mind space starts to open up. So whatever state the person was in in the first place, and no matter how little they had a free mind space, 
uh, after a time, it's going to be better, it's going to be bigger, they're going to have more power, more potential. And again, as I hinted in one of the earlier talks, it actually starts to work onto the idea of spirit being. And you'll understand from that, uh, that first chart of extended mind that if you loosen that up, then you're obviously going to have more psychic type experiences such as telepathy and remote viewing and so on. It only, only makes sense. Okay, so now that let's go. The next thing I want to introduce you to is the concept of the timeline. This is intimately locked up with memory, and in this sense, our timeline is completely locked up with who we are, our personality, our nature, our being, our character. Very important. Okay, so take a look at the the following series of charts. Okay, we can represent the timeline with a horizontal line going to the right and beyond the now, of course, that passes into the future. To the left, that's timeline running backwards. And it's made up of a series of memory imprints or mental image pictures, MIMPs, as we call them for short. Uh, most of these are pretty harmless. It's just a memory of what you were doing last week, what you had for breakfast this morning, uh, some good birthdays, great holiday last year, great holiday ten years ago, and so on. But there are, in this sequence of memories, the, the whole sequence of uh, memory recordings, MIMPs, contain some not-so-good ones. Again, our word for these charged areas is memonemes. And in this graphic, I've represented them as being partly below the line, meaning they're partly or wholly invisible. And they do tend to feed forward on each other. You remember I told you that concept of reiteration, uh, from the fractalization principle where memory repeats itself forward, but uh, it works in a cumulative way, so they build. So, if you like, the early memonemes are sending forward their charge to later memonemes, and that influences how we think later on. Uh, further back, we find these very deep black areas that are totally hidden. Uh, we need something like the galvanic skin response meter to locate these. But when we find them, they do pop into view. It's not hypnotism or anything magic, but once the, once the moment is right, as it were, and the secret to this is running off the latest stuff, it's like shoveling away layers and eventually it pops into view. And it's these earlier recordings or the earlier MIMPs that are significant. These are big. We call, well, there are three kinds of memory, memonemes, the primary memonemes. Those are big. We don't need to go into those sort of archetypal things. Secondary memonemes, uh, you know, heavy stuff like disease, uh, uh, serious uh, injuries, uh, betrayals, uh, bereavement, you know, big stuff, bankruptcies and divorce and all those things. And then we've got the tertiary, tertiary memonemes which lock onto these. They're much smaller and more trivial, although, you know, no less unpleasant. You know, my husband snapped at me and I've been in a bad mood all day. I was crying. Uh, you know, that's not a pleasant experience, so it's certainly a memoneme, but it's very trivial compared to some of the earlier stuff that we do find. Uh, okay, so a very important model that. Right at the end here, I'm showing that if we work on one of these basic memonemes and clean it up and get the charge off it, uh, it emerges in, at the, so I'm showing that as above the line, uh, it emerges into full view, conscious view. It becomes what I call clean and useful memory, so it has some lessons and some learnings in it, but it can no longer force us by being hidden. It can no longer become a buried drive that causes irrationality, uh, unpleasant emotions, and, and so on. Okay, so a very important principle to grasp like that. Okay, so here in this graphic, I've redrawn the mind in a, in a different way, if you like. I've shown the, the, the capable mind part, the free or analytic part, uh, being clear, the clear mind space. It is, as I said, analytical. It can resolve and rationalize things. It, thinks pretty accurately, it's very sharp and can come up with solutions. It is, if you like, sane. You know, it's, it's our good answers. <laughs> and as I've sometimes joked, you know, that's the bit that remembers your mother's birthday on the right day and so on. But then we've got this other mass or accumulation in there. This is the unsane part. I'm not saying insane, but contains elements that just simply don't respond to rationality. It's highly reactive, so the person 
often doesn't have a chance to think about what they're doing or saying. You know, somebody says a certain word and instantly the person, uh, you know, gets angry. <laughs> For example, this is, uh, what is 2016, so I could say the word, uh, words, Donald Trump, and a whole bunch of people will go, ah, <laughs> and they lose it. They become suddenly irrational. They have a lot of emotions surrounding, and of course, just as many other people, if you said Hillary Clinton would go like that. So th these are reactive. They're not rational. The person doesn't typically have much control over them. It has this thing called identification thinking in it, which I mentioned, this sort of X equals Y equals Z crazy formula. I mean, that's simply not true. These things are not equated, but this more simple or more primitive part of them. It's, you see, it's a defensive part of the mind. It was all set up as being a jolly good idea long ago. You know, you saw, uh, you know, a certain uh, smell, um, could be a saber-toothed tiger, I'm out of here. You know, like it had survival value, but not anymore. First of all, there aren't any saber-toothed tigers in most modern cities today. Uh, and also rationality rises above that, you know, it's m rather than just running hysterically like a, a Neanderthal might have done, I, I can't say I wasn't there, but, uh, but you know, it's better to like plan, for example, you live in a cave, you do protect the cave, you post guards and you do sensible things that will help you conquer that particular problem. And of course it needs hardly, it goes without saying that this is where we would uh, all our bad emotions, our bad thoughts and ir irrational behaviors would spring from. So the more that we can empty out this package of black stuff and dump it, the better we're going to feel. And that's exactly what supernoetics piloting does. Okay, <clears throat> just one more point. Remember I said that uh, these unpleasant experiences from the past lock up our attention units. If we lay it out in this way, slightly differently, so you can see attention being dragged to these areas on the pa in the past, uh, you might get a person saying, well, that doesn't affect me. I, you know, I'm pretty smart. I'm pretty on the ball. <laughs> I would just laugh. But anyway, if a person really thinks that, you have to point out, and that's kind of shown in this second graphic here, that the, that attention focusing factor is actually occluded. A person isn't really seeing the trouble from the past. They just know they're who they are. They think a certain way. They're impatient with children. They don't like dogs. They can't eat curries. Uh, you know, this is just how I am. And they don't link these things up to the past. The point of being a supernoetics pilot is that you see things differently. And once you start pulling charges off, once you start unblocking these memonemes and cleaning them up, the person changes dramatically. They do it in small stages or ahas, and then every once in a while they experience a huge jump. You know, we call it a shift where they have a completely different perspective on things. And this, uh, until you've uh, tried some piloting, you have to take slightly on faith, but you know, you can get somebody who starts the process uh, beginning what we call a flight uh, in piloting, obviously uh, relates to the term flying. But a person who's saying, my, you know, my mom's a bitch if I ever, you know, she's dead now, but I feel like I could dig her up and kill her again. Really, you know, heavy stuff like that. Uh, and within an hour, the person's saying, oh, you know, I guess she did the best she could. And a couple of hours later, this person is sobbing their heart out and saying, Mom, I love you. You know, you meant everything to me, and I'm sorry. Life was so rotten to you. I know you did your best. That's what we call shift, okay? That's a major change in perspective. Uh, I, I think a much better word from our usage than the concept, for example, of clearing. You may have heard that term. It's a sort of new agey term. And, and it means things gone. Well, it's a kind of absolute. Things haven't necessarily gone, but they've improved dramatically. And the negativity or the trouble or the aggravation has gone and the person now sees life and sees issues in a whole new way. You know, this person is no longer disrupt, disrupted by horrible negative thoughts of a parent, but now is actually appreciating that parent and what they did and feels love for them. And it transforms the person. That's why we talk about transformation and, of course, the mission of supernoetics is to transform the whole human race. You know, we're working for the purposeful reinvention of mankind. That's our stated mission. Okay, well, I hope you found this, uh, this uh, talk useful and gave you some clearer insight into what we're doing. More to come, of course. That'll be in future videos. Take care. Thank you.